Hello, everyone. I am uh, Romit Nikolsky, and welcome to my lecture, The Rise and Decline of Myth Recognition. This recorded lecture was first delivered as a paper in the conference Cognitive Approaches to Art, a Reassessment of Results and Articulating New Possibilities, a conference which was part of the network of conferences, Cognitive Futures in the Art and Humanities, that brings together scholars and scientists using interdisciplinary methods to study art and various cultural practices. This conference was in Warsaw on July 12th to the 16th, 2023. The paper talks about the rise and decline of mythic cognition as a major cultural cognitive strategy within the evolution of human culture. Mythic cognition is one of the three stages of the evolution of human cognition described by Merlin Donald in his book, Origin of the Modern Mind from 1991, together with mimetic cognition that has preceded it and theoretic cognition that is following it. Each of these cognitive strategies developed a corresponding human culture that is mimetic, mythic, and theoretic cultures. I will not systematically theorize either culture or mythic cognition. However, some level of theorizing is necessary as the description of the rise and decline builds on these concepts. Culture as a meaning-making process that is composed of signs, that is a semiotic process, which is a cognitive process, uh, will be the focus of Barend van Heusden's lecture this afternoon. But I will shortly describe his theory called the decoupling theory here as the background for the argument of my paper. Merlin Donnell did my work for me, so to speak, by presenting his theory of the evolution of human cognition in his online keynote lecture yesterday. So my description will be very short. So first, the decoupling theory. I'm following Van Heusden's own uh, description here. Semiosis is a cognitive process that emerges from and builds upon the brain's stimulus response reaction, which humans share with many other species. The process is reacting to a stimulus according to memory in patterns that have proven evolutionarily beneficial in past experience. However, in the case of humans, we are all also aware of the fact that the stimulus, that is the external sensory information, does not exactly match the memory. That is, it is a characteristic human capability to perceive the new as different from memory. This results in first making us aware that we have memories, but then also results in the need to explain the difference between the memory and the actuality, the, the, the new input. This explanation creates a semiotic reality common to a social group, a semisphere if you want, which we also call culture. Uh, the word explanation is somewhat misleading because we immediately think of a verbal and even rational explanation of cause and effect. But even before such cognitive tools existed, existed in humanity, that is rationality and uh, cause and effect, etc., the intentional reenactment of what is perceived through the sensory system could in itself serve as a type of nonverbal explanation, a reaction that mimics the new enacted by the mind that has the memory points to the difference. Yeah, so it is already acknowledgement of the difference. The intentional mimicking of the sensory input is the essence of mimetic cognition, the first of the three stages of the evolution of human cognition described by Donald. It is at this point in the theoretic timeline of the paper that Donald's cognitive strategies and cultures come to the fore. Each of these cognitive strategies is a system developed in order to make sense of reality. This is done by creating networks of neural patterns 
representing past experience in order to guess the meaning of incoming sensory inputs and possibly guide action in the new situation. I'm more or less quoting Lisa Feldman Barrett here um, uh, about, about the predictive brain uh, theory from her book, How Emotions Are Made. This here is a slide I show my students as a short reminder of these, of Donald's cognitive uh, strategies. What would it look like if one wants to teach someone how to play baseball in each of these cognitive strategies? To start with the mimetic, one has to act it oneself, possibly accompanied by uh, some auditory expression that mean do this, do that. This is an AI generated picture, by the way. In the mythic, in the mythic uh, cognitive strategy, one tells the story of the game. Baseball is a bat and ball sport played between two teams of nine players each, taking turns batting and fielding. The pitcher throws a ball, the batter tries to hit with a bat. The objective of the offensive team, the batting team, is to hit the ball into the field away from the other team's players, allowing its players to run the four bases to score a run, etc. I'm quoting Wikipedia here. It is involving intentionality, the interaction between people, and an end result. Or, if you want, a protagonist, a plot, etc. In short, a story. And if we mention Babe Ruth or other legendary players, the story is completely realistic. In the theoretic cognitive strategy, we find schematic expression and categorized knowledge such as you see here, information which is rational, logical, and also universal. It is thus non-specific and importantly impersonal in not relating to a single accident that is historical case or person. I use Donald's categories as analytical concepts to talk about evolution of cultures that I study, primarily moving from the mythic to the theoretic stage. I will focus now on the mythic cognition. As Merlin Donald showed yesterday in his keynote lecture, primates have inner mythic cognition, but they cannot express it as well as humans because they have not yet developed a, as good a tool for it as humans. Humans have developed language, but language is a tool to help the need. Language is not the thing that created mythic cognition. Mythic cognition builds on the kinship environment of social animals, such as primates, or to be a little simplistic, mythic cognition is a constant state of gossip. I'm referring to Robin Dunbar's research, a complex theory of mind skill telling stories about people. A story can be made obvious from gestures and not by language, possibly not as elaborate and detailed as language, but still, such is the example of this wonderful La Linea guy. But also the other example, a very static one in comparison to the La Linea is a sign that provokes the mythic cognitive strategy to activate the memory of a particular story, a story that is in the semiosphere of those who were socialized into a particular culture. Those who were not socialized into the culture will not recognize the particular story, as is in fact the case in all human semispheres, and possibly also other mammals too, they are socialized into one specific semisphere, not others, and thus might not be able to function properly in a different semisphere. This is how we should understand the connection between cognition and culture, not in universals in particular. And this exemplifies nicely the nature of what I will be doing in a minute, analyzing historical stories. But first, a few disclaimers. This is a short, disclaimer, uh, a short disclaimer slide. I'm using many concepts that are complex and debatable, but I'm not going into any deep explanation because of the lack of time uh, in such a um, short paper. So 
narratives. I'm using the word narratives to describe primarily in our cultures, verbal artifacts, which signal life events connected by a by causality. These events could be external plot events or internal such as emotions. Stories. Stories are more structured narratives that succumb to a format developed and accepted in most of our cultures in which we find a protagonist, a problem, a journey, and a solution. This structure seems to be adaptive and it is what we like to listen to as story. And we think of stories in this form. Now, literature, literature is an art form of stories that is creating them as a socially recognized artifact, which is art. And texts, texts are written versions of stories or literature. I'm working with historical cases, not historical in the sense of ancient, even though this, this is what I usually do, but in the sense of not being theoretical, but things that actually happened. This is not always taken into consideration when working in such a theoretical framework. In a way, our models allow for more options to happen than what actually happened. This means that we can imagine more possible worlds than actually exist. But what actually exists is the only thing that actually exists as far as we know. And this is what skews, you know, what actually exists is what skews the culture and moves it in a set, certain direction, thus being the mover into the next evolutionary stage. Now, why did one historical phenomena happen and not another? That is why one option gained hegemony and not others. Our simple answer is, it is because of its adaptive qualities at the moment that it appeared. However, what are the adaptive qualities is always a question that is extremely difficult to answer in the context of cultural studies of various kinds and various types of cultural studies. Now about emotions, the use of language for all of the above, that is narrative, stories, etc., entails personification as this is built into this tool that we use that is language. There is a known and studied strong connection between narratives and emotions. And Susan Keen is one of the major scholars in this field. The studies have shown that emotionality has to do with our identification with the characters in the narratives. I believe that this the connection between narratives and emotion came about because of the personification that is built into language. A tree fallen could be a non-personal narrative, but when we hear about the birds losing their home, we feel for them. And when the disaster befell one of us primates, the feeling is even stronger. I will not go into theorizing this, but the emotional impact of stories is important to keep in mind for the uh, analysis later on. When talking about the rise and decline of historical phenomena, we think of such a curve on the vertical axis, height in the sense of complexity, extensiveness, etc., and in the horizontal axis, the time. In evolution and cultural evolution included, things don't just disappear all of a sudden when others rise, but phenomena begin to rise while previous ones are still there so sort of like this. Even further, the declining part is not a complete decline, but it continues to function at a lesser level way into the future of the following phenomena and in a way supporting the latter, the new phenomena. So if uh, the greenish line is um, mimetic cognition and its culture, the brownish line is mythic cognition and its culture, and I will change it into the same pattern as the mimetic, and add the theoretic, the bluish line. So when I speak about the rise and decline of mythic cognition, I look at what it looks like in its earlier stages, in a way still within previous stage, that is just the, the mimetic one, 
what was the peak and what it looks like when the next stage, the erratic cognition became prominent and the mythic cognition became a support to the theoretic cognition. How did mythic cognition change in this new role? So what, what, does, what does mythic cognition look like in its initial stage? Before going into the text for the analysis, a short um, comic or tragic, if you want to pause to exhibit what I mean by an early stage of language. And since this is a current, current day example, after mythic cognition has already reached its peak and its decline, and we are into the theoretic uh, cognitive culture now, I'm not drawing a timeline here, but an ontological line that is showing present day representation of basic mythic cognition. The Kifnes is a South African artist, very talented one, I think, who gained more than a million audience on YouTube because of his interpretation of auditory data from animals and, and other sources. He translates these into music and language, both. I will focus here on the language. Since he is interpreting, interpreting animals, also others, but also animals, he shows their language as not strictly conforming with the way we would use it, we humans would use it, but as a more basic language, if you want, both in terms of syntax as well as in terms of plot development. So let's start with the first part of this particular story. different from the way we expect a human to express a similar idea. Especially noteworthy is the syntactical disconnectedness of the expression hello from the rest of the discourse. What does this hello mean? Here, a cognition, our mythic cognition, has to fill in details in order to have a fluent story. Is someone knocking on the door? Is the cat answering the phone? Or more probably, we think that the cat at this moment feels alone and is attempting to find out whether there is some company around. This basic linguistic expression does not contain the developed tools to tell us a very detailed account of what it wants to say, the, the very discourse wants to say. The Kifnes, however, goes on as an artist to develop a more complex story that gives us the background to the current scene, which makes us understand the story better. But also here, he's talented enough to tell this cat-like story, not so much a human one. Listen to this. a short quote i encourage you to watch the whole clip i'll put a link to it uh, below so i will not continue with the kifness but move on to an ancient story 
The first story is told by Murshili II, a reigning powerful king of the Hittite Empire in the 14th century before Common Era. The Hittite Empire was located roughly the area of Turkey today, and the Hittites were a group that spoke an Indo-European language, that means like Sanskrit, like Greek, like our Germanic and, 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 and Latin languages. Murshili II left many written uh, texts about his life and about his actions, among which there is this short one. I drove to Kanu, and a thunderstorm came. Then the storm god kept thundering terribly, and I feared. And the speech in my mouth became small, and the speech came up a little bit, and I forgot this matter completely. But afterwards the years came and went, and this matter came to appear repeatedly in my dreams. And God's hand seized me in my dreams, and then my mouth went sideways. We apparently see here an autobiographical description of an apparently trauma caused by a strong storm a trauma that possibly caused a small aphasia. We also hear about the eventual spontaneous healing process. The text is a bit clumsy, to say the least, by our standards, and we have to readjust it and add much of our own knowledge in order to understand it. Just like uh, the, the Kifnis, uh, the, the, the text in the Kifnis uh, story above, and this again is presenting now an historical example of the base, the basic language, yeah? a language which is less developed in terms of its tool to, um, to describe the story. The second story is a famous passage from the Confessions of St. Augustine from the fourth century. The, this is from the Confessions, book two, chapter four. Yet I had a desire to commit robbery, and did so, compelled to it by neither hunger nor poverty, but through a contempt for well-doing and a strong impulse to iniquity. For I pilfered something which I already had in sufficient measure, and of much better quality. I did not desire to enjoy what I stole, but only the theft and the sin itself. There was a pear tree close to our own vineyard, heavily laden with fruit, which was not tempting either for its colour or for its flavour. Late one night, having prolonged our games in the streets until then, as our bad habit was, such was my heart, O God, such was my heart, which thou didst pity even in that bottomless pit. Behold, now let my heart confess to thee what it was seeking there, when I was being gratuitously wanton, having no inducement to evil but the evil itself, it was foul, and I loved it. I loved my own undoing. I loved my error. St. Augustine spends the rest of Book 2, chapters 5 to 10, going into depth about the anatomy of sin and the blackness of his own heart. Now, whether we completely understand what Augustine wants to tell us, it takes some serious socialization to understand it, actually. What is certain is that we have a detailed story focused on the protagonist with long explanation of what has happened and what the, the drives and the emotions involved were. This is the height of mythic cognition of, in this case, non-fiction non -fiction genre where the tool can be so well utilized as to render the audience totally manipulated by the teller, drawn into the story, and creates in the mind of the audience, yeah, the, the audience create in their own mind a complex reality, including complex emotions, according to what the author wants us to do. We know it, we know it later on in novels that are long and complex, but here I wanted to use an example which is not literature, but, uh, but uh, autobiographical, um, autobiographical text, and it starts in the fourth century, as you can see. The third text is Barack Obama's inaugural speech in 2009, when he was elected president of the United States. The part that is parallel to the previous two texts is the autobiographical part, and try to find this in the, in the recording of this speech. 
This is the price and the promise of citizenship. This is the source of our confidence, the knowledge that God calls on us to shape an uncertain destiny. This is the meaning of our liberty and our creed, why men and women and children of every race and every faith can join in celebration across this magnificent mall, and why a man whose father less than 60 years ago might not have been served in a local restaurant can now stand before you to take a most sacred oath. The point I want to illustrate here is the following. Barack Obama is a great rhetoric. At this point in his career, he had to gain the support of all Americans. So he uses narrative in order to place himself as an exemplar, as a model of American values. And he does this with the extremely short narrative of about 25 words to invoke the desired story in the mythic cognition of his audience. The sentence that is meaningful to us is here, as you can see on the slide, and why a man whose father less than 60 years ago might not have been served in a local restaurant can now stand before you to take the most sacred oath. And so this gives enough biographical data for the audience to develop the right emotions toward Obama and his uh, role. It is thus creating solidarity of the imagined community of Americans, creating an imagined community of fellow citizens in order to be able to rule millions of people who are actually strangers to each other is a common move in our theoretic culture in which personality is reduced to an identity and bureaucracy is the ruler. So our being a citizen, an American citizen is what creates the solidarity not, of course, the fact that we know each other, not the, the fact that we are friends with each other, not even the fact that we are of the same family as the kinship type of uh, group creation in, in the mythic cognition, cognition and the culture that it creates. However, mythic cognition is triggered by using this short sentence as a sign to invoke all the emotions necessary to direct people into the behavior of solidarity. So the, the, the story, the narrative, the autobiographical story is again reduced to something very narrow, very undeveloped, which is used as a sign in a whole general system, which is theoretic cognition. We are thus able to cooperate on a scale uh, never, never seen earlier in our evolution. This is thus the, ri the, the rise, peak, and decline of mythic cognition from a clumsy story to a highly developed, emotionally manipulative narrative into a symbol that triggers the same emotions, but with a very um, thin text. Thank you very much for listening.